Okay, like I was talking a little while ago about finding inspiration. Well, you don't necessarily need to just find inspiration from other authors. Locations and old stories and places and things can inspire you with all kinds of stuff. I just got back from a nice week-long vacation down in the Big Easy. And, oh, you want to talk about inspiration. Where do I begin? First off, just wandering around the French Quarter. The different style of architecture, all the interesting people you meet. Wandering down the streets. It reminded me of some of the places I were in Africa where, you know, they didn't have the big fancy signs, you know, with the neons and everything like, you know, you, you see around here. They might be hand painted and hanging off this little lattice or some jury rigged hanger in front of their, their businesses. And that's what, you know, everybody, oh, this is so-and-so. And they think it's absolutely perfect. You know, the streets, because of the the flooding and, you know, the, the traffic and everything, sidewalks are broken up. Streets are broken up. Garages must make a fortune on alignments and tires and everything else down there. But, you know, walking around, you just practically pick up inspiration in the air. And then when you've got all these tours, you've got all these historic places, you've got all these ghost stories. A city that has changed hands. You know, you had the Spanish, you had the French, you had the Americans, then you had the Civil War. You had Reconstruction, uh, you know, it went through a downslide for a while economically and everything else. And then it went through this big renaissance and resurrection and, you know, all the ways it rebuilds itself after each hurricane. It's a city that is just begging to be written about. One of the tours I went on, it was a ghost store, you know, ghosts and vampires and I mean, it, it's the city of Anne Rice, so obviously they're going to talk about vampires. Uh, Lestat, you know, the alleged St. Germain stories, uh, all sorts of things. You went walking around and seeing the Lollary Mansion, seeing the Museum of Death, the voodoo shops, the cemeteries. One of the places that we stopped actually had nothing to do with vampires or anything like that. It was dealing with a pirate, legendary Jean Lafitte. Now, if you're not really big into American history, I can guarantee you probably never heard of Jean Lafitte. And you can imagine he was a French pirate. Well, he liked being in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico and all that other stuff. And New Orleans was a great place to hang out because it's very close to Mexico. It's got lots of bayous. And in the early 1800s, we didn't really have a big coastal patrol. You know, the Coast Guard wasn't as prevalent as it is now, even if it existed back then. Um, so New Orleans became a great place for a pirate to hang out. Also being pretty much on the frontier of the American society, law and order wasn't going to be a really big thing. And so he could pretty much, as long as he didn't cause too much trouble for them, he could function with impunity. Well, pirates are driven by acquisition and anything shiny that attracts them or anything very beautiful. In this case, he was driven by his desire for the governor's wife. As you can imagine, the governor's wife was flattered. As you can also imagine, the governor was not. And so he decided he was going to do something about this, so he put a bounty on Jean Lafitte's head. Well, Lafitte realized that the governor only had access to public funds, which are somewhat limited. He, being a pirate, had access to more funds, which were a little less limited. So he did the only thing that a sensible man in his position could do. <laughs> he put a price on the governor's head, too. Well, as you can imagine, this makes things very, very tense and causes a lot of problems and conflict. And 
he realizes he's got to find some leverage to get the upper hand. Well, this was during the American War of 1812. And he realized that he could pitch an idea to the British, figure out how to help them seize and take New Orleans. Now, if the British got control of New Orleans, that would give them control of the Mississippi, and they would be able to link their holdings in Canada with the holdings in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, completely cut off the United States from the rest of the Louisiana Purchase, and act with impunity. Perfect. Well, the British Admiral was thrilled with the idea, and they sat down and they worked out this really, really great plan. And then as soon as they were done, John Lafitte turns around and he goes to General Andrew Jackson. And he says, I know for a fact that the British are planning X, Y, Z, and this is what they're going to do. And this is their objective. And this is their goal. And this is how they're going to accomplish it. And Jackson basically asks, well, how do you know all this? And Lafitte smiles and said, well, I gave them the idea. And they're waiting for me to carry it out and help them and everything else. So if you will do X, Y, Z, I will be more than happy to double cross them and wipe out their whole thing and keep them from seizing New Orleans. And Andrew Jackson says, oh, that sounds like a capital idea. And so the two of them got together, fought the Battle of New Orleans, won one of the most decisive victories that America experienced during that whole conflict, completely wiped out the humiliation of seeing Washington being burned, and catapulted Andrew Jackson into immense popularity with the American people that pretty much exists even today, established him as a hero, launched him to the presidency, all with the help of a pirate who basically wanted to have an affair with the governor's wife. And another little side note, Nobody involved, whether the British, the pirate, or the Americans, knew that the War of 1812 was technically over. It had ended just a little while before. But because of slow communications in those days, the news of the signing of the Treaty of Ghent hadn't reached anybody yet. Oh, well. But yeah, you know, down there with all that type of intrigue and Machiavellian planning and plotting. Yeah, it's easy to get some really cool inspiration. And then there were a few ghost stories that, oh, well, I kind of pressed for time, so I'll tell you about those later. And of course, you can't go to New Orleans without visiting Cemetery Number 1, the famous grave of the voodoo queen Marie Laveau, the voodoo authentica, Museum of Death, all these really cool places that talk about some of the seedier sides of the human personality. Excellent places, however, if you want to draw inspiration for mystery, suspense, thrillers, horror, all kinds of different things. Historical fiction, romance, yeah. If you're looking for inspiration, the Big Easy has got to be on your list. The fact that you can get drinks to go is just a side benefit. 